we've moved into an era where individuals have to navigate their career or architect their career, as opposed to people just getting on the conveyor belt of a large corporation's career development platform and moving along at the timelines set by someone else. Now people are saying, well, I need to decide what skills I want to acquire and what roles I want to have and what compensation I'm willing to accept, which can be very exciting because there's a lot more options. And it can also be really overwhelming because the yeah. choices are not so clear cut. I'd love to understand how we can actually evaluate a company. There's online research you can ask in the interview process. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions in the interview process. If somebody asks really smart questions, it makes me more excited about them. Absolutely ask questions. Interviews are a two-way street. So I always encourage people to ask their interviewer questions about their experience. If someone doesn't let you ask questions or they really rush you through that process, I would say that's a yellow flag. Hey, Catherine, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise, I'm super excited for this conversation. So to introduce you to our Yap fam, you are the CEO and founder of The Muse. It's a career platform that's been used by 75 million people to research companies and careers. The Muse was recently named one of the fast companies, 50 most innovative companies in the world and number three most innovative company for enterprise. You are also the co-author of the New Rules of Work book. And today's episode is going to be focused on the trends of the new job economy. And we'll also get into some actionable advice on how to find a career for you and land your dream job. But Catherine, first, I want to learn more about your journey. Before you became an entrepreneur, you were a young girl who had dreams of becoming a secret agent. You majored in political science. You took all different language courses in college, and you even traveled across the world. You found yourself working at many different companies and organizations like the U.S. Embassy and McKinsey and & Company and the Clinton Health Access Initiative. So help us fill in the gaps. How did you go from international relations to then running the fastest growing career platform, The Muse? Well, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of people have these very winding career paths early on. And it's really because it's it's hard to know what you want to do until you actually get out in the world and start doing it. And if mm. you're lucky, you love what you're doing, you enjoy it, you advance. But for most of us, it takes a few tries and a few different attempts before you land somewhere and you think to yourself like, yeah, I could really do this for, you know, for a decade or more. And so for me, you know, that journey, as you said, it started, um, I actually started thinking about my career when I was 13. 14, my family moved to the Washington, D.C. area. And yeah, I became fascinated by international relations, history, political science. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. I will be an ambassador or a secret agent. I have it all figured out. And um, luckily, several years later, I had the chance to work in a U.S. embassy in Nicosia, Cyprus um, at the U.S. State Department. And I realized like, oh, my God, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought it was <laughs> at all. And, you know, it's kind of jarring when you're in your early 20s. You you think you're kind of have something figured out and then you realize it's very different than you expected. And so um, I, you know, I felt very lost, frankly. I had no idea what I wanted. I felt kind of directionless. I ended up... Um, having a good friend who wanted to work for McKinsey. And so I went with her to a recruiting event and, you know, they were pitching, we're going to help you solve the world's biggest problems and it's business boot camp. And I was like, okay, well, I have no idea what I want to do. So maybe this is a direction that will, you know, kind of help me move forward. And I ended up getting the offer. That's when I moved to New York City. Um, and there were a lot of good things about McKinsey. I learned a ton, but I knew from really a month or two in that I, I didn't want to be a consultant for the rest of my mm. life. So I was back to square one. You know, what do I want to do? Spending time on job sites and just interviewing and talking to a lot of people about their careers. And um, and out of that experience is really what um, what led to the idea for The Muse, because I realized that if it was this hard for me to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do professionally and, and how do I find a, a job and career that aligns with my values and with my priorities and with the type of life I want to build, if it was so hard for me, I probably wasn't the only one. Mm, I love that. So we're going to talk about how to find the right career for you, which you are a true expert on. But first, let's talk about macro trends. So you wrote this book, co-wrote this book called The New Rules of Work, the modern playbook for navigating your career. It was put out in 2017. And the world has significantly changed since then. I mean, you wouldn't have known it back then, but the pandemic, you know, took us by storm. It completely changed everything in terms of the way that we work. So I want to discuss the new, new trends of 
work. You do tons of research at the Muse. So you have plenty of information about how things are now. And so I want to talk about the great resignation. I want to talk about quiet quitting, shift shock, all those kind of key trends that everyone keeps talking about. So let's start with the great resignation, right? So everybody has heard this. I feel like I've literally heard it a hundred times. The pandemic has emphasized that life is short. People are less likely to stick around unfulfilling jobs. They're, they're quitting, starting their own thing. And so for those of us who haven't heard of it, what is a great resignation? How have you seen it evolve over the last two years? And is it still a thing that employers need to worry about? Yeah, absolutely. So exactly as you said, you know, the great resignation was a massive trend that started um, really in the middle of 2021 as uh, certain sectors of the economy first started to come out of the negative impacts of COVID. Um, and a lot of employees across ages, across industries, across job types woke up and said, why am I killing myself for this job? Um, I, I want to do something different. And so um, from a you know statistical perspective, we saw the highest level of uh, worker quitting by month. And this is voluntary quitting, a worker giving notice and leaving their job um, mm -hmm. in many, many months in 2021 20, uh, that we have ever seen since the Bureau of Labor started um, started capturing these statistics. We also mm -hmm. saw things like for every worker looking for work, there were two open jobs. So employers were not only seeing incredibly elevated levels of departures, of churn, but they were having a really hard time recruiting new people because there were so many jobs open as the economy was rebounding from COVID and so many fewer people looking for work. And the people who were looking for work had much higher standards. Now, mm -hmm. I, I think this is a really good thing overall, because I think that as an economy, we have been on this journey for the last 10 years that has been empowering workers and giving workers and individuals more power, more control, more leverage. And for employers, it's been giving them a bit less. Now, that said, there's a lot of variations by industry. Um, engineers and uh, high tech workers have a tremendous amount of leverage. A lot of workers in retail or other hourly positions still don't have um, as much. And a lot of people would say still don't have enough leverage. But by and large, I think the the macro trend that we've been seeing for, for quite some time, I would say since um, really the early 2000s, has been sort of slowly but definitively moving towards workers having more say. And the great mm. resignation was a massive accelerant because all of a sudden, like you said, people realized during the pandemic that life is precious and short. And it, it made a lot of people say, is this the job that I want to stay in? Mm. And there was this kind of perfect storm where as some workers quit, jobs opened up, employers were offering better working conditions, better pay, more incentives to recruit, which made it more attractive for other people to leave their jobs. And the cycle continued. Um, mm. And, um, you know, it's also been really interesting. Uh, you mentioned we'll talk about shift shock in a bit, mm -hmm. but we've also seen these sort of just you know, not only increasing rates of um, employees leaving companies in general, but also um, employee tenure has shortened. So there's a kind of a whole trend of people starting at a company and saying, wait, this is actually not what I want either. And then mm. leaving in short order instead of toughing it out for two or three years, which used to be more the norm. So these dynamics are changing the entire workforce. They change what an individual can expect out of their job search. And they're absolutely changing how employers are thinking about not only kind of attracting and hiring their talent, but also keeping them. So I, yeah, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> there's so much to talk about. And to your point, a lot of people are calling the great resignation, the great renegotiation. They're yes. saying, no, it's all about leverage. And a lot of people aren't quitting. They're actually just asking for better salaries and demanding that they get compensated for their work. Whereas I remember when I was in corporate, you know, I, I, I'm no longer, I'm an entrepreneur now. I have a, a social media and podcast agency, but I used to work in marketing at HP and Disney and all these Fortune 50 companies. And I remember it was like, you just, you waited to get a raise. You didn't really ask for one. And now I feel like it's, I have 60 employees and everyone's always asking for raises because it's normal now. Yeah. I think we've moved into an era where, individuals have to navigate their career or architect their career as opposed to people just getting on the conveyor belt of a large corporation's career development platform or, or kind of program and, you know, moving along at the timelines set by someone else, you know, from afar. Now people are saying, well, 
I need to decide what skills I want to acquire and what roles I want to have and what compensation I'm willing to accept. And it's also been interesting to see that companies have been thinking much more expansively. They're not Mm. just saying, all right, we probably need to pay more, but they're also saying, can I invest in professional development or growth Mm -hmm. opportunities for my team? What about my vacation policy, my time off, my flexibility? Um, You know, what benefits do I offer? And are those a match for the kind of type of diverse workforce that I want Mm -hmm. to attract? It is this wholesale reimagining of what does it mean to um to to have a business how you know what is the social contract between individuals and employers and by the way you know you mentioned um that the, the, some of these macro changes i think one of the other interesting ones is um you know social media has sort of created a environment for many people where we are living parts of our life online so we know more mm. about our friends jobs and our friends companies we you know for those of us that have for example a linkedin profile which i'm sure a lot of people is so um you know there's this tendency to start to feel like well my job is not just the way i pay my bills it's a source of meaning it's part of how i define myself and the impact i want to have on the world um, for people that are thinking long term about certain types of careers, they think about the brands that they associate themselves with or the roles that they take as part of a narrative story about who they are going to be as a professional. So what this means is, again, that employers have a responsibility not to just uh, pay fairly, which, of course, is very important, but they also have to think about um, the the broader relationship that they have with their people and you know whether that's a brand perspective, an impact perspective, a professional learning and growth perspective. There are so many more things to think about as a company and as an individual, which I think can be very exciting because there's a lot more options. And it can also be really overwhelming um, because the choices are not so clear cut. Yeah. And honestly, this is so interesting to me. And I have to say, I completely agree what you're saying about social media. I think the other thing with social media is that it's actually giving employees more leverage. I can take myself for an example. I became a really big LinkedIn influencer while I was working at Disney, so much to the point that I was more popular than the CEO at Disney Streaming Services, which is what I worked (laughs) for, to the point where it made me so powerful at Disney because they'd be like, can you help us promote this? Can you talk about this? And all of a sudden, I went from being like a middle manager to being really important because I was the most popular person online at the company. And so the things I said and did really mattered, right? And so it does give you a lot of leverage and not to mention once I like was a thought leader online and was looked at as like a top marketing thought leader. I felt like I had the best insurance policy ever when it came to, I felt like I never had to look for a job again in my life after I built that. So I hope we get into have time to talk about that later. Uh, But first let's talk about quiet quitting because this is a concept that's really brand new. I think it started bubbling up in August is when I first heard about it and everyone is talking about it. Damon John is talking about quiet quitting even. And funny enough, quiet quitting is not actually about quitting. People who are quiet quitting are not outright quitting their jobs. They're quitting the idea of going above and beyond. And to me, That's not young and profiting behavior. I feel like that's a very passive way to approach your work and your career. And polling company Gallup found that at least half of Americans or maybe more fit this definition of quiet quitting. I thought that was really shocking. And I have to admit, I thought that maybe this behavior is coming from a lot of the high performers quitting their jobs and what's left behind are people who didn't have a lot of motivation to begin with. Now, this is just that's just my own opinion, but I'm curious to hear why, why do you think this is happening? Why, why are people behaving like this? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Um, I think there's a lot of truth in what you said that we are starting to see a tale of two populations in the knowledge worker workforce. And I specifically call out knowledge workers because I think in a lot of more um, service economy jobs, quiet quitting isn't necessarily as feasible. You still have to, you know, do the same number of um, hours, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of show up in a more kind of focused way. But for a lot of creatives, knowledge workers, individuals that are primarily working at a desk job, quiet quitting has sort of taken the media universe by storm because it's such a... Uh, it's such a kind of spot on catchy term for a very relatable phenomenon, which is people saying, you know what? I give up. I will give you the bare minimum. I will clock in. I will clock out. But I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going further. 
at the same point, um, we also see a large population of the workforce that is doubling down on, um, you know, a side hustle, building up their online or social media presence, um, starting to work on a book proposal or, you know, contributing article. Like there, I, I think we're seeing these sort of two approaches to work that are dueling it out. And what I actually think is very interesting is I think we're starting to see companies fall into two corresponding buckets. There are companies that say, we are going to live and die by the strength of our talent. And so we are going to work hard to attract great people. We are going to reward them. We are going to accept that they have high standards for us. And they should because they're talented people who could go anywhere. And so we are going to up our game as an employer, as someone who offers learning and growth opportunities, offers great comp and benefits, we're going to say, hey, our talent could work anywhere. So we have to convince them that we are the place that they want to do great work. And in exchange, we're going to expect them to go above and beyond. And then you have employers. And by the way, we we work with all types of employers at the Muse in my business. Um, but sometimes I will talk to leaders, HR leaders, CEOs, et cetera, who are like, I don't like this new way of working. I give you a paycheck. You do your job. That's the arrangement. Why is everyone trying to change it? And my perspective would be, great. That's the arrangement you want. That's the arrangement you're going to get. And that mm. is the type of environment that I think particularly encourages this quiet quitting phenomenon. Because when employees don't feel respected or supported by their employer, much less when an employer isn't working hard to think about how to motivate, how to incentivize their people, what 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 is human behavior, right? You get people being like, cool, I will do exactly what you pay me for and not an ounce more. Um, and by the way, I think quiet quitting, you know, it's a very relatable phenomenon because almost everyone has at some time or other felt like that their work and their energy and their mm -hmm. hustle has been taken advantage of. I do think there's a risk in that um, if the economy hits, you know, a road bump or there are additional signs of a downturn, employees that are quiet quitting could be more at risk for layoffs um, or cutbacks. But at the same point, there are businesses where a lot of employees are taking that step back because the business itself, the leadership, the management um, hasn't given them a great reason to do anything more. And so I actually think we're going to see this, um, you know, you mentioned before that people are calling the great resignation, um, the the great, what was the word you used? It was the, the kind of great, great renegotiation. Great negotiation. Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, I, I love that. And I, I was using the term like the great rethink because I think there's mm -hmm. this sense of uh, really talented people that want to give more than the bare minimum are looking for organizations that that encourage that, that reward that, that want that. Um, and, you know, and, and people are less likely to just stay around in organizations that don't treat them well because it's what they've always done. Yeah. I mean, I personally feel like doing the bare minimum at your job, to your point, is basically being the first one to get laid off. And the economy is not doing that well. I have a lot of friends that are getting laid off right now. So I advise my younger profiters to figure out how to get out of this burnout feeling because I think it's burnout at the end of yes. the day, right? When you're just like, I'm fed up. And so I'm just going to give the bare minimum. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, how can we re-energize ourselves at a job, right? Let's say the company is not the worst company in the world. And and it's to your benefit to stay at it because their values are good. The compensation is good. But maybe you're just so burnt out and like kind of had enough. How can you re-energize yourself at that job? What would you say? Yes. So my recommendation would be, first of all, take a step back and think about what are the most impactful things that you could get out of the next three to six months? How much mm. you go about this process, um, depending on the amount of time that you have and that you're willing to dedicate to it. I would say anything from, you know, sitting quietly by yourself for an hour at a coffee shop, journaling about where do I want to be in one year, three years, five years, are there skills or experiences that I don't have today that will be either critical or beneficial for putting me on the path to where I want to go? And are there small actions I should I, I could take or I should take either inside my job or outside my job that will help move me in that direction? Hmm. If you have additional time and you want to go a bit deeper, I love the exercise of thinking about what are some of your core career values what are some of the things that you most want to prioritize in this next three to five year segment of your life? That could be 
uh, compensation. It could be prestige. It could be creativity, flexibility. There's a lot of different things. Um, and you can even, frankly, Google uh, core values and, and look through and see what resonates. Um, and then if you want to go a little bit deeper, I would recommend asking a few friends who've seen you in a professional context or former colleagues um, to kind of play back to you. Where do they see you most in flow? What do they think that you are excellent at? And is there anything from a skill or experience perspective that they think would make you even stronger? And then mm. once you're sort of armed with this kind of condensed sense of the, you know, just a couple of, you can you can literally pick one to three things that you want to try and learn, do, or accomplish professionally in the next three to six months, then you can start thinking about how might I do that? One option mm. could be going to your manager and saying, you know, I love working here and I want to get back to, you know, giving 110%, but I've been finding that a piece of me is craving a new challenge. And so I was wondering if in addition to the XYZ that is part of my job, there's an opportunity for me to, and then again, depending on the culture of your workplace, the role that you have, et cetera, you may want to propose something additional. You could suggest uh, exchanging something that you're doing with something else. Um, you could ask if there are step-up opportunities. Um, I think the idea here is to give yourself a mental framework for what it is that you want to accomplish, why it matters to you. And then I like the three to six month time horizon because it's long enough to actually do something, but short enough that um, you don't necessarily feel like you're making these lifetime decisions. You're simply saying, you know, okay, um, I want to step in to a new skill. That kind of back and forth dialogue, I think can actually be really re-energizing. Re like re re um, yeah. and, and it may seem counterintuitive, frankly, when you're burnt out. Obviously, if you have the time to take a vacation, take a mental health day, those are very powerful things as well. Um, and, and very necessary, right? Like rest um, at the appropriate times is critical to being able to ramp back up again. And, and I find that Burnout is sometimes about a lack of excitement or a lack of motivation mm -hmm. or a lack mm -hmm. of that learning or newness or something that that keeps you wanting to push forward. Um, so it's not just about taking a step back. If you take a step back and then you go right back in to the exact same environment, you're liable to get burned out again. Um, but thinking yeah. about how you can sort of point yourself in a direction um, is surprisingly useful, I think, for getting out of that quiet quitting mentality. What's up, Young and Profiting YouTube listeners? This episode of Yap is brought to you by Sabio. If you guys are looking for a career in tech, I don't blame you because it's such a great path to take. Tech careers offer work-life balance and often the opportunity to work remotely. And of course, a way to become young and profiting with tons of potential for income generation. If this perked your ears up, I want you to consider Sabio. They're a coding bootcamp and developer community that's been training successful software engineers since 2013. And there's a huge need for software engineers in today's job market. And that demand is only going to get stronger as more of our world moves online. Sabio does much more than just teach you how to code. Their bootcamp actually gives you real life experience and they help you find a job as a part of their program. Their bootcamp is taught remotely so you can learn from anywhere. And after just a few months, you'll graduate with the knowledge and confidence to start a high paying tech job. In fact, some of Sabio's alumni are working at companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Activision. And Sabio's students say that their program changed their lives. I can see why Sabio has been voted the best coding bootcamp by Course Report five years in a row. Sabio is extremely affordable. They offer financing options that make it even easier for you to get started. And I highly encourage any of you guys looking to get into tech to check out Sabio. Sabio can set up your success in tech. Right now, all of my young and profiting YouTube watchers can save $125 on their total bootcamp cost. Visit my special URL. That's sabio.la slash yap to learn more. Again, that's sabio.la slash yap. We've got the link pinned in the comments here in the video. Don't wait. Go to sabio.la slash yap today. Yeah, I feel like you just gave such a great framework for us. And it reminds me of something that Jason Pfeiffer just told me on the podcast. So Jason Pfeiffer, he's the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. And he talks about this thing called opportunity set A versus opportunity set B. So opportunity set A is all the things that you are responsible to do at work, the things that you get paid for. Opportunity set B 
are the things that you could be doing at work to go above and beyond to learn the new skills that you want. So you just gave such a good framework to apply this opportunity set A versus B. So I love that. Um, So let's move on to some of your own research, Catherine. According to a recent survey of more than 2,500 respondents from your career site, The Muse, 72% of American workers say that they have experienced starting a new job and then realizing to their surprise or regret that the position or company was very different from what they were led to initially believe. You call this surprise a shift shock and you distinguish it from the ordinary new job jitters. So let's talk about the research you did. Why is this phenomenon happening? Why is it harder to figure out if you're going to like a new job in 2022 versus let's say five or 10 years ago? Yes. So I love that you brought this up because I think this speaks to a bunch of these trends we've been talking about. So as you said, you know, shift shock is, is something that has actually been happening for a long time, but that we've only recently had a name for, which is that, Mm. you know, I I hope I'm allowed to say this, but it's kind of like that, oh shit feeling (laughs) when you start a new job and you realize (laughs) this is not what I thought it would be. And, you know, I actually think that the, the, the experience of feeling that surprise or regret when you start a new job, um, it's obviously not always the case. A lot of people start new jobs and think, wow, this is exactly what I thought I was getting. You know, I'm, I'm so excited to work here. But in the mm-hmm. past, people had less recourse because in the past, leaving a new job in under two years was often frowned upon. I mean, I don't know about you, mm-hmm. but I remember when I started at McKinsey uh, back in, gosh, almost 15 years ago, Um, someone sat us down and they were like, by the way, this is a minimum to your commitment. And if you leave in less than two years, it will be a black mark on your resume that could, you know, hurt your chances to ever get hired. This message was communicated to so many people and employers would often really discount a candidate that had a short stint, even one on their resume. That has changed dramatically in the last two years, especially with the great resignation, but also with this rise in um, kind of a a worker or an individual's right to say, well, no, this this job isn't meeting my needs. It's not, um, you know, as advertised. And so paired with that shift shock statistics that 72 percent of the workforce has experienced starting a new job and realizing it's not as advertised is the fact that 80 percent of people now think it is perfectly acceptable to leave a job in under six months if it's not as advertised. And by the way, I think it's the case as well. Um, Most of the hiring managers that we work with at The Muse are very willing to overlook a short stint. Now, if you have three short stints back to back, that can still raise a flag, of course. But if you have some longer stints at companies that show that you can dig in and be, you know, dedicated, but then you have a, a really short stint or frankly, a lot of employees and individuals are leaving really short stints off their resume. Um, And if asked about a gap, they'll say, yep, absolutely. I left, you know, my so-and-so company um, because I was offered XYZ, very exciting sounding thing. When I joined, either it wasn't as advertised, the person who hired me immediately left, the culture was not in accordance with my values. Um, And so I left and then I, I went to this new position or now I'm looking for a job. And the vast majority of hiring managers are like, yeah, okay, that seems right. And so we've seen in in two short years this huge cultural shift, which I th- again, I think it's a positive thing. It's unlocking an individual's ability to say, no, I, I don't accept this agreement. It's also forcing employers to be more honest about how they recruit because in the past, there were companies that literally relied on a very fancy recruiting process to mask a sort of unpleasant working reality. And they were able to get away with it to some extent because there was a cost Mm. on employees that left in short order. Now, because employees are more free to move around, employers are saying, all right, well, we better actually create an environment we're staying at. So I think that this is, um, you know, it's been destabilizing for some companies that have put a lot of time and effort into hiring individuals only to see them quit in a short period of time because of shift shock, because of this surprise. But again, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing uh, to encourage more transparency in the hiring process. I mean, I like to Mm. use online dating as an analogy. Can you imagine if you had an online dating profile, you got to go on, you know, two to three dates with someone. And then at the end you had to make a decision about them. And if you said yes, you had to stay in a relationship with them for two years. Like that would be (laughs) absolutely terrible. There's so much that first of all, that you, that you just don't learn about a company in the interview process. But also people in companies both are not always honest in how they present themselves. And I think the phenomenon of the great resignation, 
of people talking about shift shock and doing something about it by leaving companies that they feel have misled them or have changed the terms of the game. Um, these trends are coming together to create more of a market incentive for businesses mm. to say, we need to be upfront. And the thing is, like, yeah. just like every human that you might date has, you know, their wonderful qualities and their quirks or their challenges, almost all companies have incredible attributes and challenging ones. And not all companies are a fit for all people or are going to be a great place to work for all people, just like not all people are great to be friends with or great to date. But the more I think that there is um, some kind of upfront transparency and authenticity in the interview process, in the dating process, the more likely you are to make a good match. Yeah. I have to say, I know you've experienced shift shock personally. So have I. I remember when I started my career at HP, I loved that job. It had a great culture. I got promoted like five times in four years. And then I got recruited to Disney. And it was like this new shiny object. And I, it was Disney and Disney streaming and a hot new industry. And I basically got convinced to move over to Disney and I was miserable. And then I ended up starting, you know, my side hustle on the side because I was so unhappy at Disney. And it just goes to show that like the grass is not always greener. So I'd love to understand how we can actually evaluate a company and if it's actually harder to do that now because everything's so virtual. You know, I think um, the answer is yes and no. It is much harder to evaluate a company culture in a virtual interview process than it is in an in-person interview process. So, you know, if you have the opportunity to go into a company's office, you know, you're sitting in the lobby, perhaps waiting to be called into the interview. You can see a little bit of how people interact. Do people seem happy? Is it an open office or cubicles? There's so much that we don't even realize we're picking up about the work environment of an organization when we are physically in their spaces. Um, and that can be much harder to get in a virtual environment because typically you're Zooming one-on-one -on -one with another human. They probably are in their home in a lot of cases or in a single conference room. And so you only get the limited amount of information um, that they communicate or that you can sort of see. That said, um, there's so much more information available online. Um, it's much easier to kind of get the behind the scenes of what mm -hmm. a company's like. And there's more comfort with transparency in the interview process, which can help you. So some of my tips for uncovering a company's culture before you join. Um, firstly, I would say that there's a few different steps. There's online research. There's the questions that you can ask in the interview process and the information you can glean by how you're treated in asking those questions. And then lastly, there's a kind of deep diligence and back channeling to people who work there. So let's take them quickly one at a time. So first, what can you find online? I would recommend that anyone uh, Google a company before your interview. Firstly, it makes you seem more informed. Learn a little bit about whether the company has made any announcements in the press. Um, if you are meeting with leaders or people on certain teams, is there anything about those teams in the news? Um, you can look and see if they have uh, if that company has a profile on LinkedIn, on The Muse, on other sites that might give you a sense of what are some of the themes that the company is trying to communicate? Are there any employee testimonials? Testimonials that might be helpful. Um, just you know, you can you can do a lighter um, kind of research before a first interview, and then maybe if you're called back in for a follow on, you may want to go a little bit deeper. But there's a lot more information online that will at least give you a sense of where to dig. How does the company want to present itself, and what are some of the things people are saying? Then in the yeah. interview process, absolutely ask questions. Interviews are a two way street, so I always encourage people to ask their interviewer questions about their experience. I really like what I call kind of paired questions or positive negative questions, um, which would look like this. You might say, you know, in, you know, I, I noticed that you've been working at this company for two and a half years. In terms of how you've experienced the company culture and the work environment, can you share with me one or two of your favorite things about working here? And then one or two of the things that might be more of a challenge and someone should know? When you ask someone to give you a really positive thing, something that they like, something that they're excited about, paired with something that is more challenging or a little bit harder, you are much more likely to get uh, an honest answer because, first of all, people feel like they can tell you the things they like, they can tell you their favorite, they can talk up the company a little bit, and then they're, they're more likely to feel comfortable sharing something that is, well, you know, sometimes people here who like speed can find that we move a little slow. 
And, you know, I don't mind it because we're very collaborative. We move slow, you know, blah, blah, blah. But like you'll you start to get people sharing with you um, something that's more true. Also, if someone doesn't let you ask questions or they really rush you through that process, that I would say that's a yellow flag. It's not quite a red flag, but in general, most companies these days should be giving you time to ask questions. They should be encouraging all of their recruiters or hiring managers to talk about the company culture, to let you ask questions. So if they're not doing that, like definitely dig a bit deeper. And then as you get closer to the end of a process, you can start to ask more hard hit qu hitting questions. Like, you know, can you walk me through what time of day most people typically log on to Slack and start answering, you know, emails? Um, or, you know, when, when does your first Zoom of the day start? Um, do you typically end up working on the weekends? You know, I'm, whatever it is that are your biggest questions, I think that um, I would save anything that is kind of work-life balance related that's at a more detailed level for near the end of the process when you feel mm -hmm. like they're pretty, they're pretty excited about you. Also, um, it's a bit of a balance. You don't want to give the impression that you're not willing, for example, to yeah. work hard. But um, I think there are sometimes ways of getting around it. Like, hey, you know, I'm really excited and and I typically tend to work pretty hard, but I also just love to get a sense. So my expectations are set up front. How do you all typically work around here? You know, what might that look yeah. like? Um, and then finally, if you do get close to getting an offer or you actually get that offer, um, if you have the ability to look through LinkedIn or other platforms and uh, potentially even talk to someone who can give you a little bit more insight on the company, um, do take that with a grain of salt. Not every company is a great fit for everyone, but it can be a helpful way of just understanding a little bit more. Um, in fact, when I recruit executives to the Muse, I will often offer to let them speak to both current and former former folks who have reported to me to just understand my style. Because again, my perspective is like, if you understand exactly what you're getting into and you opt into this job, then you're going to be much more effective, much more likely to be successful than if you join and you feel like, whoa, I didn't know that mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. And by the way, don't be afraid to ask questions in the interview process. I know as being a hiring manager for many, many years that if somebody asks really smart questions, it makes me more excited about them. I feel like yes. they're smarter. I feel like they're really engaged. They're really excited. They prepared. And so that's actually a really good thing. So don't be afraid of doing that. So last question before we get into some really tactical advice on finding your career, landing your career job. And this was actually really great in terms of the interview process and some tips around that. Let's talk about quitting because quitting is really expensive on both sides of the coin. So talk to us about the cost of quitting both for employees and employers. And when is actually the right time to quit? Because we talked about like re-engaging and re-energizing your current job. But when when is it just time to, you know, even if you don't have a plan B, just jump ship and, and go for it? Yeah. So this is a deeply personal decision that that is impacted by so many factors, your career field, your savings, uh, whether you have a safety net, whether you're in an industry that is easier versus harder to get rehired. Um, and so I would certainly say that um, anyone considering quitting should look at their unique situation, how you know long they would be willing to go without work, et cetera. But just in terms of a couple of principles, first of all, um, I would I would always suggest that someone try and talk to their manager or their company if there are um, kind of smaller specific changes that might keep them engaged. So many companies these days really don't want to lose their people. And so if it's the case where something that the company has the ability to change, something that they could offer you to stay um, would make a big difference. I think that it can be really powerful to have that conversation with your manager or with HR. Now, first of all, you have to know what it is that would change your mind to be able to ask for it. So step one, um, if you're thinking about quitting, is to just, again, I would say take half an hour in the morning, maybe even 10 minutes if you're really crunched for time. But I, I like to give myself a little bit more time so that some of the deeper stuff bubbles up. Um, and just sit with this question of, you know, what am I trying to move away from and what would I be trying to move towards? And those can be different things. You may say, you know, my colleague drives me insane when he clips his fingernails at the desk or, you know, I'm not being paid <laughs> enough. I want to move towards more financial abundance. Um, and just, you know, again, get a sense of what are the things that you want to leave behind? What are the things that you want to move towards? Then I think it's a helpful exercise to say, could I potentially do this within my current company, either by transferring internally 
or by having a conversation with my manager or others to change my current situation. Um, depending on whether you feel like you are in an economically comfortable or precarious situation, you could choose to have that conversation right away um, with your manager. You could also choose to go out, get a sense of your market value, maybe even get close to having another offer before you have that conversation. Um, that again is a very personal decision. But I think when you have clarity on what you want to leave behind or invite in, it is much easier to either ask for it where you are or go out in the marketplace and find it. The last thing you want to do is quit a job from some sense of vague frustration and dysfaction, go out, search for a new job, start it, and then realize, in fact, you are in a very similar position. Because now you don't have <laughs> the relationships, the credibility, and the tenure of your old job, and you're you're sort of stuck in the same place again. By the way, it does happen. It's not like a career ending move. You can recover from it, of course, in a lot of ways, but it is much more advisable to try and get whatever clarity is possible before you quit. And then last thing I would say here is if you do decide that leaving is the right answer, um, no matter how much you might want to just burn the place down emotionally, um, if you can manage to do it in a respectful and diplomatic way, um, it will pay dividends in the long run. I cannot tell you how many times I have um, talked to someone who was going to make a hire and then did a back channel reference and found out that you know this individual um, did something kind of that would be perceived negatively on the way out. Um, it can mm. it can make it harder for you to get job offers in the future. Um, you know, it can follow you for a long time. I think typically it's just not worth it unless there's something no, that is illegal and you need to kind of, you know, make some sort of structural change. Um, obviously, I think that can be positive. But if you're just like pissed, um, you know, express to your friends that you're angry write on a piece of paper how much you hate your boss light that paper on fire feel good inside but don't you know don't do anything crazy in the workplace um and i and i would say if you leave professionally you never know when you're going to encounter those colleagues yeah. those individuals again yeah and there's so especially with big companies people will leave and come back right and i think with the great resignation they're calling this boomerang employees they're leaving then they're getting shift shock, realizing grass is not greener. <laughs> then they're boomeraming, bo boomeraming right back to their previous job. So also for that reason, you don't want to burn that bridge. I totally agree. So I'm just going to ask one question about um, something that's really actionable in terms of landing our dream job. I think we gave a lot of context for people to find the careers that they want. So let's talk about resumes. Yes. Uh, and CVs. Because for me, I think the last time I actually actively looked for a job was seven or eight years ago. And I remember even back then, I would submit my resume into this like black hole oblivion. And I feel like nobody ever read it. It was so hard to like get a call back. And so I'd love to hear your advice on do resumes matter anymore? And what are some ways that we can kind of hack that process so we can actually get some interviews? Yes. So resumes do matter, unfortunately, for a lot of jobs, not all jobs. If you get recruited through someone reaching out to you directly, you may be able to go through the process without ever submitting a resume. But for most of us and for most jobs that require an online application, you're going to have to put together a resume. My number one best tip is to actually look at the job description that you're applying to, highlight any key skills or experiences that the position requires, and then make sure to the extent that it's accurate, that those specific and exact words appear in your resume. Because the dirty secret mm. of online job applications is that a lot of companies are using um, kind of, you know, machine learning to screen resumes. So they will actually have, before your resume ever gets to a human, they will have um, an algorithm look through it and say, you know, check, check, check. Does it have the words that I want, the specific language that the hiring manager has indicated is important? Um, and if so, pass through if not, you know, put in a second tier bucket or reject. And so you can maximize your chance of getting your resume seen by a human by having, and again, it's, it's very silly. We, you know, synonyms, we should all be able to use it. But the, but the fact of the matter is not all um, applicant tracking systems are great at deciphering the difference between, you know, two or three different words that mean the same thing. So to the extent that you can mm -hmm. kind of align the language, great. 
definitely keep your resume to one page. Um, if you have something additional to share, I think it's great to include a link to an online portfolio, an online website. Um, you can also include an addendum if you feel very strongly, but I would really encourage people keep that resume to one page and focus on what you did. You know, everybody knows that uh, a salesperson, you know, closed deals, but can you talk about going above and beyond, exceeding your quota, coming up with a creative new way to increase business, whatever it is that really spotlights how you are different, um, the better. And so anyway, I know we could talk about this a lot longer. Um, there is a lot of great advice on themuse.com if people want to check it out. But those are kind of my like favorite, favorite tips um, for just making sure that you get noticed so that you have that chance to, you know, to really shine. Yeah, 100%. I think, Catherine, we're going to have to have you back on to really dig deep about how to find your right career and all that actionable advice that we're looking for. So a couple last questions and then you're, we're going to go. So what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profiting tomorrow? Ooh, find someone who you admire professionally and follow them on whatever social channels they're active in to understand what they're reading, what they're watching, what they're listening to, so that you can start to just pick up some of those little things that may not be obvious from the outside. I love that. And what is your secret to profiting in life? I spend time getting clarity on what I want because it's hard to know uh, how to prioritize your time, which activities to say yes to and no to if you don't know what you want. Now, this can be as silly as, you know, I'd like to make sure I have time to foster a dog in September. Um, it's personal, it's professional, it's all of the above, but I write a lot of stuff down. I spend a lot of time in reflection. And I think when you know what you want and what you don't want, you're much more likely to be able to go and get it. Yeah, that is some excellent advice there, Catherine. Where can our listeners go learn more about you and everything that you do? Absolutely. Um, so my um, Instagram is probably the platform that uh, I'm most active on. I'm at K Minshu. I'm also at K Min on Twitter. Um, and then I would love for people to check out themuse.com. It is the in business that I have been pouring my heart into for the last 11 years. There's so much more advice than I've been able to cover here. Um, and, uh, you know, feedback, thoughts, et cetera. Just um, hit me up on social. Awesome. Thanks so much. I love this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Take care.